Today we're going to be learning Masechet Nedarim, Daf Ayin Dalet. Today's Saf is sponsored by Becky Goldstein, in memory of her father, Yoel Halevi Ben Meir and Rivka Fram. Teenage Holocaust survivor from Buchenwald, Abba arrived alone in Canada searching for his shlichut in life. He dedicated his life to Torah and Gemilu Chassadim. He challenged my thirst for learning. I miss his special nigunim. He was my guiding light. Okay, this is the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to start at the Mishnah at the top of the page. Shomeret Yabam. Explain what this is. Those who learn Yavamot will be familiar with this term. If not, I will give you some background. Shomeret Yabam is someone who is waiting to do the mitzvah of Yibum. That means her husband died with, they had no children, and therefore she is supposed to marry. He had no children, so she is supposed to marry his brother, one of his brothers. And while she's waiting for this to happen, he either does Yibum, which is fulfilled by having relations with her, or he does chalitza, which is the whole thing with the shoe. She spits in it, takes off his shoe. She spits in his shoe and says, you know, you didn't want to continue your brother's name. It's kind of like a divorce, but a little bit different. So Shomeret Yabam, the question is, while she's in this interim stage, and you might remember from Yibum that there was this whole discussion, how close is their connection? Are they somewhat like they're married because they're supposed to get married to each other or not? We're going to see in the mission, does it depend if there's only one brother? What if there's a number of brothers, two brothers or three brothers? And then it's not clear which one's going to marry. So the question is, during this interim stage, can he nullify her vows? So to which the mission says, we're going to have three opinions. I mean, it doesn't matter if there's one brother, two brothers, three brothers, four brothers, doesn't make a difference. He says, the brother can nullify her vows. Now what, all brothers? So we'll see you later in the Gemara what exactly this means. But it seems like one brother can come along and nullify her vows. Rabbi Yoshua, it doesn't mention anything about the father or anything else. We'll see later in the Gemara. The Gemara is going to say, well, it must be. First they're going to assume no, and then they're going to say, well, it must be he means with the father, okay? Not by himself, because he's certainly not like a married man. Uh, he's not married to her. He's just, it's maybe similar more to betrothal. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, lechad of only if there's one brother, but if there's two brothers, okay, let's say there was Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, Levi dies, his wife falls to to Reuven and Shimon, if it's two of them, then no, they can't be Mayfair, because either one of them, we don't know which one's going to be the one, but if there's only Reuven and Levi, and Levi dies, and she falls to Yibam to Reuven, since he's the one, therefore he can nullify her vows. Rabbi Akiva Omer, lo lo no way, no how. He's not married to her. He can't nullify her vows at all. So now we're going to see in the Mishnah, they're going to have a discussion between them. And we're going to see a little bit what, on what basis they think this, although the Gemara will explain it even better. Amar Rabbi Eliezer, ma'in isha, shakana hula atzmo, harehu mefreya if a woman is acquired by a man himself, meaning if he betrothes her, he can, right, he decides, right, there's no connection between these two people, but he decides and she decides, right, we want to get betrothed to each other. She can only do betrothal with her, with her, uh, if she wants to. She agrees with her agreement, her consent. That was the word I was looking for. So now, if he takes some random woman he has no connection to, and he acquires her, he can be made fair her nidarit, he can nullify her vows. So he shashi knulam in a this woman is not some random woman that he's going to end up marrying. It's a woman that God declared by the, the laws of the Torah that he's supposed to be marrying her. She's supposed to be acquired by him. So we know that is obviously much more strong than two random people. So of course he should be able to nullify her vows. Now that right now doesn't sound like he did any sort of form of erusing. But soon we're going to see the Rabbi Ami explains that it must be he did something like a Rusin, you might remember this from the from Yibum called from Yivama called Ma'amal, which is similar. Okay, Yibum I said is fulfilled by by having relations, but the problem is that first of all, that's a very primitive way. What you're going to say, okay, having intercourse with a woman, that's how you fulfill your mitzvah, and before you do anything else. So the rabbis instituted for various reasons, that being one of them, this thing called Ma'amal that we're going to have something that's like, it's parallel to Kiddushin for Yibo, okay, so that he doesn't just get into bed with her, okay, so there's this par- the parallel action called Ma'amal, even though it's not mentioned here in the Mishnah at all, we don't know if there was Ma'amal or not, 
Rabbi Am is going to assume that it must be he meant there's Ma'amar, and then there's a normal comparison here. Right? We have a man who had no connection to the woman from the beginning versus a man who had a connection to the woman because the Torah commanded it, right? God commanded it. So then we have stage two is he does Kiddushin and the other one does Ma'amal. And then they're at equal footing, right? But this one is much closer, the Yaban, because the Torah said they should get married together. So of course, if the first one can be made for them during the regular marriage, obviously in this case as well, even though, right, they only did Ma'amal. We'll talk about that soon. Again, like I said, the mission makes no mention of it, but it seems to be somewhat implied here. The Kabbalah is going to explain why Rabbi Ami thinks it must be there was Ma'ama. Amar la Rabbi Akiva, lo, no way, no how. I'm going to knock down your logical argument. When he acquires this woman through Kedushin, this woman who was a Pnuya, as they say in Hebrew, she was free to anybody before she was single. Once she gets betrothed, she's forbidden to everybody else. She's only going to be ultimately permitted to him in marriage. But she's forbidden to everybody else. But this woman who is betrothed to him by, who is, sorry, uh, connected to him by Torah law, as you have to marry him. But she was also connected by Torah law to his brothers as well. So he doesn't have something unique, right? Rabbi Leazar said, whether he has one brother, no brothers, two brothers, three brothers, it doesn't make a difference. He can nullify our vows. To which Rabbi Akiva says, well, then they're not comparable. Because your situation, described as if, right, the way you describe the comparison, it's not the same. A betrothed man is betrothed to this woman who is now forbidden to the rest of the world. This woman is permitted to other people besides him, his other brothers. To which Rabbi Yeshua comes in, who Rabbi Yeshua distinguished between one brother and no brothers, and, right, he being the only one. You have a good argument against Rabbi Lezer's element of two brothers. But, what do you have to say to my opinion? My opinion, it's equal. Basically, if I take Rabbi Lezer and I apply it, well, then it's exactly the same. One man, one man, right? She's exclusive to him, exclusive to him. And then the logic should work. So what are you going to say to that? Amar lo, he basically says the Yavama is not acquired by the husband. Maybe he means through Ma'amar, we don't know. In the same way that in Arusa is Gmurah Isha. In other words, the relationship. You can say what you want. Logic, not from God, not from God. But the fact is, halacha on the ground, and we'll see this later, the very end of our Gemara for today is going to quote a bright where he says the same thing, but in different words that, and they're going to learn from there, it's not stated explicitly, but when it comes to other laws, for example, Nara Murasa, betrothed woman, who sleeps with another man, she sleeps with another man, she gets skila, stoned. But if a Shomeri Tabam sleeps with a different man, she doesn't get stoned. So there you see, and even if she did Ma'amal, again, we haven't talked about Ma'amal, but we're going to understand all of this as if there was Ma'amal. So even if they did some action that's parallel to Kiddushin, her status is not the same. So therefore, he says, the proof is in the law. They're not the same in that area. Therefore, they're not going to be the same in annulling vows either. To which the Gemara starts off and wants to understand all the approaches. And the Gemara immediately introduces the word Zika, which wasn't here until now. Zika, as I said, is something we describe in Masechet Yivamot. It's a big theme throughout the Masechet. Do we hold Zika? Do we not hold Zika? How much do we assume the Yabam and his future potential wife, the Yivama, are connected as if through some sort of, right? How strong is the connection between them before they've actually done Yibum? Or is it not? Okay. Until they actually do Yibum, there's really no connection. Yes, it's true. There's a commandment, but also they could do Chalitza. So maybe they're not so connected. There are all sorts of ramifications of this. So our, our, our Mishnah is one of them. Bishlama Rabbi Akiva Savar Ein Zika. So Rabbi Akiva very simply holds Ein Zika. There is no Zika. Okay? We don't hold that there's Zika. And this is, as I said, a big machloka throughout Masechah Yivamot. So he basically says there's no Zika and therefore there's no connection between them. And again, Erusin is stronger than, than Mama, and therefore he can't annul her vows, even if he's the only brother. Rabbi Yoshua Savar Yesh Zika. Rabbi Yoshua says there's Zika. But again, the Zika will only be strong if there's only one brother. If there's two brothers, then they're sharing the Zika and then neither one can annul the vow. Ella Rabbi Leezer, my timing. But what's Rabbi Leezer's reason? And we're going to raise a question on him. 
e yesh zika. If he holds, there's zika, but ain't brera. But we don't hold brera. Remember, brera is also a big machlok that we've seen throughout Chas. And assume here that we don't hold by brera. Brera is retroactive designation. If Ruven was the one who comes over and annuls her vow first, if we'd say there's brera, then we could say, okay, well, there's zika. They're connected, but they're only connected if he's the only one. Well, as soon as he does some action to show connection to her, he becomes the one. That would be Yesh Brera, that retroactively was designated as if before he did it, he was the one, once he does it. But we don't hope Brera. So that wouldn't work. To which Amar Rabbi Ami, Kigon Sha'asaba Ma'amal. And this I kept making reference to, but now we see it inside. Rabbi Ami says it must be that he already did Ma'amal, which is like Kiddushin. And then he designated her to be to him. And there you have it. That's why. So number one, there's Zika. And he did Ma'amal, which makes it much stronger. So even if there's two brothers, he's the one who chose, I'm going to be the one to do the mitzvah. And he started. He didn't finish, but he started. Well, we'll see. Maybe that's important that he didn't finish it. And maybe that's why there's disagreement here. And not only that, but you have to say, you might remember this from Masechet Yuvamot. If not, we'll review anyway. Rabbi Eliezer, Savar Lekebet Shammai De'amre Ma'amar Konekin You have to say, and there's a big debate about Ma'amar as well. How much of a Kenyan is this? Is this just something very symbolic? Something the rabbis instituted, so maybe it's just symbolic. It doesn't really have halachic, serious halachic significance. But Beit Shammai said, it's konekin yangamu. It's a full acquiring. It's an act of a kinyan, as we say. So therefore, once he does, so Rabbi Lezer basically holds, let's go backwards now. He holds, they did mama, and he holds like Beit Shammai, the mama is significant. And that's why he can annul her vows. Rabbi Yeshua Amal, Omer Lecha, Rabbi Yeshua will say, Hanimile, or Amar, could say it's Amal, right? I think, yeah. Rabbi Yeshua Amal, Lecha, he could say to you if he were here, Hanimile, Bechad Yabam, Ava Bashne Yabamim Lo. That's only true when there's one Yabam. When there's two Yabamim, it's not strong enough. Why? Mi i kamidi, Dechiate Achoi, Asara Le Bibiao Begita, Umefare? It's a rhetorical question. He says, how could there possibly be a thing? Now, you might remember we learned this in Masechet Givamot. Is there Ma'amar after Ma'amar? What happens if one brother does Ma'amar and the other brother does Ma'amar? What happens if one other brother does Ma'amar and the other one gives a get? If you remember, a get in Yibum means there is no get in Yibum. It's Chalitza. But what it means is the, the brother's rejecting her. Once he rejects her, no one can marry her. So basically, the get overrides Ma'amar. Also, if the other brother does Chalitza, it overrides Ma'amar. Okay? If the other brother does Bia, if he has relations with her, it overrides the mama. So basically, right, he's kind of taken her ready to do yibum. Mama, right, doesn't have so much strength that it can't be overridden by another brother. So comes Rabbi Yeshua and he says, when there's one brother and there's mama, great, perfect. Then he could do afara because he did a Kenyan on her, no, no problem. But when there's two brothers, it can't be mi'ika, midi. Could it be something that dechiate choi? I'm just re reviewing that sentence again and going through it. When one brother comes, asara lebebiya, after the Reuven does ma'amal, Shimon comes, let's just assume, right? There's Reuven and Shimon. Shimon does bi'a with her. He has relations with her. Or he gives her a get, obigita. And then Reuven's going to come and be made for the neder? Can't possibly be. In other words, Ma'amar is not that strong because it can be overridden by the other brother. So once his other brothers, we don't give him the option to be made for the nether because what if his brother comes later and uproots his Ma'amar? Rabbi Kiva Savar simply ain't Zika. Okay. So those are our three explanations. You can look at the chart on today's study guide and it charts out the three approaches and the explanations. Now we start asking, that was all Rabbi Ami had to explain to us. The real problem was Rabbi Lezer's opinion. And he explains Rabbi Lezer's opinion in saying there was Ma'amar. There wasn't Ma'amar, there's nothing to talk about when there's more than one brother. So now we're going to ask two or possibly three questions of Rabbi Ami. I say because the third section here, it's not clear whether it's a question or whether it's more of a said in a statement. We'll get to that when we get there. Ula Rabbi, uh, Ula Rabbi Elazal, don't read it as Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Elazal, who's an Emora, not the same Tana Rabbi Eliezer who appears in our Mishnah. The Rabbi Elazal, the Amal, who said, Ma'amar lebeit shamai, eno kone ela lidchot b'tzara. There's an opinion of Beit Shammai. Some people think that Beit Shammai held that Ma'amar is Kinyan Gamul. It's complete. But, right, like Kiddushin. But, Rabbi Lezal holds 
that Beit Shammai only said, and now, um, before I explain this, I just want to tell you there's two explanations. Rashi has a much more complicated explanation of this. It's in the Kaftet of Yavamot. I'm going to explain according to the simpler explanation, which is Tosvot and the Me'iri. That when Beit Shammai says Ma'amar is Kone, he doesn't mean a Kinyan Gamul, complete acquiring. All it does is, okay, now let's go back to our case. Levi was married to two women, Yael and Noah. Levi divorced, I'm sorry, Levi died. His two wives fall to Reuven. Okay, let's just assume there's Reuven right now. Now, they fall to Reuven for Yibum. What happens? Reuven is supposed to do Yibum or Chalitza with one of them. And only after that, the other one can go get married to whoever they want. And if the first one, right, if he does Chalitza to Yael, then Yael and Noah can go get married. If he does Yibum to Yael, then Yael is married to Reuven. And Noah can go marry whoever she wants. But comes Beit Shammai and says, if Reuven does Ma'amal, which is like this engaged betrothal, with Yael, then Noah becomes permitted to go marry anyone she wants. Okay? That's the theory here. And then, that's all it does, though. There's no real acquiring of, ya of um, Yael by Reuven. It's just that it shows, I plan to do whatever I'm going to do with you, frees up the other wife, but it doesn't really do a real Kenyan, which means how can he then, according to Rabbi Elazar's approach to Beit Shammai, how can we explain Rabbi Eliezer? He shouldn't be allowed to nullify her vows. So, my Yichalamemar, how can this be explained? To which the Gemara says, according to this, well, we're going to get even more specific. It wasn't just that he did Ma'amal. It was more than that. Kigon bidin At a certain point, if the husband, or the Yabam, Reuven doesn't deal with, okay, he does Ma'amar with Yael, but then he never goes ahead and marries her. So Yael can take him to court and say, listen, he's supposed to marry me. Either marry me, do Yibum, or divorce, you know, uh, give me Chalitza, so that I can go and be free and go marry whoever I want. And mainly she's saying, I need some financial stability. It's not just I want a husband. I want someone to take care of me financially. So if he was put up to, in court because he wasn't dealing with it, and the court said, listen, deal with it. And until you deal with it, you have to pay her Mizono. You owe her food. So start giving her food payments. Ah, Now the Mishnah is talking about a case, so there was Mahamal. Then he started giving her food payments. Once he started giving her food payments, that gives him the rights to nullify her vows. And where did we learn this from? We talked about this earlier. We didn't read it inside, but we quoted, well, we talked about it. Uchidir Rav Pinchas. As Rav Pinchas says, sorry, we did. It was in yesterday's stuff. As Rav Pinchas says, Mishmei Derava, Ko Hanoderet Aldat Baalahi Noderet. Anyone who takes a vow, vows with the knowledge of her husband. Why? Because her husband is financially responsible for her. And therefore, since he's financially responsible, she won't take a vow unless he's going to agree to it. Same thing with the Shomer, this Yabam. The Yabam, while she's waiting to do Yibum, the Yabam already is financially supporting her. So therefore, she's obviously taking vows only if he's going to agree to them. That's what gives him the right to be made. So now, based on our question, according to Rabbi Elazar and his understanding of Beit Shammai, we're going to have to explain, again, only according to him, we're going to have to explain that it was a more unique case. Not only was there Ma'amar, but also he was financially supporting her. Next, now we're on Amabe. It's not. Second question. Amar Rabbi Eliezer. Uma imisha. Okay, now we're just quoting our Mishnah, and we're going to prove in the language of our Mishnah there must be Mama, that it doesn't sound like this Mama. Okay? And then we're going to say why it's fine. There is. Uma imisha shakanala atzmo. What did Rabbi Leisar say in the Mishnah? A woman who a man takes on his own regular marriage, harehu mefer He can annul her vows. Isha shehi knula min shamayim enodin shemefer nedareha. So a woman who was God de declared that they need to be together. Obviously, he should be able to. Now, what's the problem here? Well, Ibisha Saba Ma'amal, Kanal Atzmo, who? Uh, Iba, sorry, Ibisha Saba Ma'amal, Kanal Atzmo, who? Now, if he did Ma'amal, he acquired her for himself. One second. Um, Saba Ma'amal, Kanal Atzmo. One second. And then, right, ah, that's the issue. He says here, Isha sheknulo min shamayim. What's the problem? The Mishnah says, what's unique about this case, right? And that if Rabbi Ami says that it's ma'amal, 
It's not a kinu menashamayim. He acquired her himself by doing an action of ma'amal. So that doesn't match the argument that Rabbi Lezer made. Rabbi Lezer was saying, God declared this. But if he did ma'amal, he created the relationship. And then it's just like betrothal, and it's no stronger, which was his whole argument. To which the Gemara says, what do you mean? Shekanala atzmo al yidei no, he acquired her through Ma'amar, that's true. But it was because God declared it. In other words, acquiring someone without God saying you should marry her is not the same as acquiring someone through Ma'amar when God declared that you should acquire that woman. So the fact that they say there's a difference between God declaring and man declaring, it's also man in this case, but it's man and God versus man without God. Okay, and that still makes it strong, and that still works with Rabbi Elias. Now they're going to ask another question, possibly. Okay, the Gemara is going to start with the following words. Tifsho to buy Rabbi. From Rabbi Ami, if Rabbi Ami says that this is Ma'amal, that the case on the mission is Ma'amal, then we should have been able to answer this question of Rabbi. And I'm explaining this part as if it's a question right now, and then I'll explain it how it's not. Rabbi had a question at some point, and they didn't answer the question. So now they say, well, if it's so obvious that Rabbi Ami's right, then we would have been able to answer the question of Rabbi. And the fact that we didn't proves that Rabbi Ami's wrong. Or, likewise, the Mishas, or in a different way, the Mishas just saying, now that Rabbi Ami said this, and we resolved all the questions against him, and that's not a question at all, we can answer this question that Rabbi asked by the following. Okay? So this is an intro to either a question or just a statement about it. Ma'amai the Beit Shammai. So Rabbi asked the following question. Ma'amar, according to Beit Shammai, which is who we're discussing, Egusinose, Onisuinose. Is Ma'amal comparable to the marriage ceremony or the betrothal ceremony? Until now, we seem to be saying it's the betrothal ceremony. Certainly not Beit Shammai. But Beit Shammai, who says it's Kone Kinyangamu, maybe it's a Kinyangamu of Nisuin. And then you just haven't fulfilled Yibum until you actually have intercourse with each other. But the, the rest of it is done, right? The, even the marriage part is done. Or is it Eversin? Is it just betrothal? So if you go by what Rabbi Ami said, that the husband can nullify the vows, then what would you say? Tifsho, denisuino se. Why? Because, again, this all depends how you read it, but right now they're going to read it in one way, which I mentioned as I read the Mishnah, which is not the way I read it, but to eat eusino se. If it's betrothal, hatna nara morasa vio bala we know already, we've learned this many times, that when she's betrothed, it's not just the husband, it's also the father who have rights. And what did the Mishnah say? If she's a Shomer at Yabam, the betrothed, right, the, the Yabam can then nullify her vows, as if by himself. So there you have it. They must, it must be like marriage, if it was Ma'amal, right, and that's what Rabbi Lezer said, it's Ma'amal, Ma'amar kone kinyan gamur, and now we have, according to Beit Shammai, because that's all, Beit Shammai, according to Beit Shammai, Ma'amar is like marriage. Because you see here, the father doesn't even play a role. To which the Gemara says, uh, Rav Nachum Bar Yitzchak answers, no. Rav Nachum Bar Yitzchak, my yafir, yafir b'shut hafut. The Mishnah's topic wasn't the father. The father, it's obvious, is going to be part of the picture. She's not even married to him yet. So you could say, no, it, it's Eusin. And it meant he has rights to an all with the father, but not without the father. Tanya nami hachi kirabiyami. Now we're going to bring a brighter to say we hold like a brighter to support Rabbi Ami. Rabbi Ami is in Amora. If he can use a brighter to support what the Gemara can say, we have a brighter to support his reading. It makes it much stronger. So now we're going to read this whole Mishnah. We're going to finish with that today. And then, I'm sorry, this brighter. And then the Gemara in the next stuff is going to say, how do we prove it from here? You can already start thinking as we read through and we'll see. So now this is, uh, it's actually a Tosefta that proves it. Shomer Yabam. Ben Yabam Achad, Ben Shnei Vamim. This is going to start off just like the mission. A Shomer Yabam, she's waiting to do Yibam, whether there's one brother or two brothers. Rabbi Lezer or Mary Yafel, he says she can nullify, you can nullify the vow, the, the, the Yabam. Rabbi Yoshua Amal, Le'echav Elo Only if there's one brother, not two. Rabbi Yekiv Omer, Lo Le'echav Elo L'Shnaim. Okay, not one, not two, not at all. Amal Rabbi Lezer. So now we're going to have arguments similar but a little different than the ones we saw in our mission. Umay Misha, She'en Lo Chelek Ba, Ad Shalo Tavo Le'Rishuto. A woman, the husband, has no connection to her at all until he betrothes her, right? Any random man and random woman, no connection and no rights to nullify her vows unless he betrothes her. 
But Mishabat Lerishuto, as soon as he does the betrothal, Nigmeralo, it's complete. He has complete rights with the father, but he has complete rights. Therefore, Isha Sheyesh Lo Chelak Ashalot Avol Lerishuto, she already has a connection to him before they became betrothed. Right? It's similar to where the Gemara said it's Mina Shamayim, but it's a little bit different. It's more that they're already connected to each other. It doesn't bring in God to the piece, to the picture, but. They're already connected. So So of course, when they do an action like, you know, here it seems to indicate, like Ma'amal, right? An action like Eversin, which would be Ma'amal, all the more so, shouldn't he have the rights to nullify her vows? So that already seems like it's proving Rabbi Ami, that there was Ma'amal. Amar lo Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva responds and says, lo, not true. Im amarata bi'isha shekanahu la'atzmo. If you're saying about a woman that he acquired himself, just like before the marriage, he had no rights to her yet. After the Erusin, once he betrothed her, no one else has rights to her anymore. But but when it comes to a woman who God declared that they should be married, that he already has some rights beforehand, but he's no different than the rest of his brothers. And there's numerous people who have rights to her. So therefore, we're not going to allow any one of them to nullify her vows because there's multiple people here. To which Amr lo Rabbi Yeshua, Akiva, Dvarecha B'Shnei What you're saying, same kind of argument as in our Mishnah, only applies if there's multiple brothers and there's other people who have uh, rights to her or, or connection to her. But, what are you going to say about one Yabam? To which he answers, right, what if there's only one brother? And then Rabbi Yeshua says, at least my opinion should stand. Marlo, now he says this very unclear statement, but we'll explain it the way the commentaries explain. That's who said we're going to make this distinction? One Yabam, two Yavamim, whether he did Ma'amar, whether he didn't do Ma'amar. In other words, what he's basically saying is forget about the one Yabam, two Yabam, forget about Ma'amar, not Ma'amar. I'm going to prove to you that no matter what, he doesn't have rights. How do I know so? Just like in other areas of law, and this is the same argument he made in the mission, just using different words. Just like in other areas of law, which the Gemara tomorrow is going to say, Nara Murasa, with the skila, with the stoning, whereas a Shomerit Yabam doesn't get stoning if she sleeps with another man. So, therefore, we're going to treat, just like in other laws, we're going to treat Nadarim exactly the same way. And just like she's not going to get stoned, because she's not really a betrothed woman, likewise, in Nadarim, he's not going to be able to annul her vows. So it has, that has nothing to do with one Yabam, two Yabam. My first argument, you're right. You could distinguish. But this argument holds water no matter what. And Belashana is a nice ending to this Tosefta. And then, like I said, tomorrow we'll talk about how this provides a proof for Rabbi Ami. Belashan Hazeh Amal ben Azai, Chaval Alecha ben Azai, Shaloshi Mashad Rabbi Akiva. In these words, after Rabbi Akiva gave that argument, Ben Azai said to himself in the third person, Chaval for you, Ben Azai, that you didn't, you weren't Mishamesh, you didn't serve Rabbi Akiva more. And you would have learned from his, in, from his brilliance. Okay? And he said, what a loss for you. Okay, for what a loss for myself, he says. Because he's so, so brilliant. Okay, with that, we finished today's staff. I'm going to just quickly review what we did. We brought three opinions in the Mishnah. The Mishnah themse- itself showed some argumentation between them. The Gemara clarified what the machloket is and why each person said what they said. Mainly, it's a breakdown between yesh zika and zika. But then within Rabbi Yezer, we're left to say, as Rabbi Ami says, it must be there was also ma'amar, because zika wouldn't be enough if there's more than one brother, because you'd need to use breira, which we're not using. And then, with Rabbi Ami, we asked two or possibly three questions, or we asked two questions, and then the third was just kind of making a comment about something you can infer from his answer but was rejected and all the questions were, were resolved. And then we bring a bright to support that um, Rabbi Ami's explanation that it must be Rabbi Lezer's time that there was Ma'amal. And then tomorrow we'll talk about how the bright proves that Rabbi Lezer holds that the Mishnah was talking about when there's, or Rabbi Eliezer's opinion in general is 
that he can nullify the nadir as long as he did ma'amar. If he didn't do ma'amar, then he couldn't nullify the vat. With that, we'll finish for today. Wishing everyone a Shavuot Tov. Uh, we'll meet up on Sunday. And a Shabbat Shalom, if you're listening before Shabbat.